Well, good evening, uh, everyone. Good evening to everyone here live. And I know we have many attendees uh, appearing virtually. Thank you very much. My name is Randy Nussbaum. Uh, my law firm, Sachs Turney and I, have been proud sponsors of Gen Genocide Awareness Week for many years. And we're especially pleased to be helping out this year at ASU. Tonight's presentation is especially uh, exciting for me because of its outstanding panel and it involves a subject which I've studied over the years, Germany and its Nazi past. We are very fortunate to have with us today, first of all, virtually, we have Ambassador O'Donnell, who's right here, and good evening, Ambassador. Um, he teaches at ASU. He was in the Foreign Service for 37 years before retiring in 2007. We're also gonna hear from our own uh, Volker uh, Benkert. He's a professor at ASU and an expert on how Germans have reacted to the Holocaust and learned to, to deal and acknowledge it. We're gonna have Carolyn Gay will be here. She's the honorary consul to the Federal Republic of Germany. Finally, we are honored and he's on his way. He's literally in the hallway, right? He is trying to find his way through the maze of the Memorial Union to get here, but we're honored to have Consul General Stefan Schneider. He started his diplomatic career for Germany 35 years ago and has served all over the world and will provide us this evening with a German perspective on Germany and its Nazi past. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Randy. Um, All right, yeah, I apologize that uh, Honorary Consul Gay and, and uh, Consul General Schneider are not here yet. Uh, Consul Schneider had a, had a, a plane uh, a flight canceled on him as he was literally boarding the plane. <laughs> the, plane the flight was canceled, but uh, he managed to secure another flight uh, that came in a little bit later, uh, but they're here. I just spoke to them and they will be joining us shortly. So for now, I fear uh, you just have to bear with me, but, but uh, they'll be here very soon. And um, one thing that is important to me about Genocide Awareness Week is that uh, we, we talk about a lot about genocide. We talk a lot about uh, um, a memory of genocide, um, but we're also really starting to see parallels between different genocides that we have discussed in the course of, of uh, the last couple of days be that Rwanda, be that uh, Bosnia, be that Armenia, be that uh, the Assyrian genocide, be that Native American uh, displacement and, and murder in this country, we are trying to delineate commonalities between these uh, events, these atrocities that differ in place and time quite a bit. And uh, that I think is where the exciting work of the next few years for, for scholarship will need to, to be. So our topic for today is, of course, also memory related uh, justice, restitution, memory, Germany and its Nazi past. And uh, let me just open with, uh, with uh, some, some remarks about uh, where I see the story is. And uh, um, then we will have the actual diplomats uh, who, uh, uh, particularly in Edwards O'Donnell's case, was uh, heavily involved in restitution cases in Germany as well. He was serving in Germany. Uh, um, uh, uh, tell us how this uh, actually went down. The remarks that I want to make uh, are, you know, just a little bit about uh, complicity. I think we have to establish that ordinary Germans were by and large complicit uh, in uh, the Nazi crimes. I will then talk about how we go from this complicity to uh, the very difficult, painstaking, long, not always truthful, not complete, often ineffective process of coming to terms with the past, a very German kind of word as if the past can be mastered and once mastered can probably be uh, forgotten. So there's a, already a problem in the terminology uh, used. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of new memory. We are, uh, especially after 1990, in a very, very different phase generationally. Uh, German, Germany changes demographically. There's a whole lot of memory that is coming uh, in, uh, to Germany right now. And that of course changes how we, uh, uh, how we uh, commemorate. And then of course, there's the grandiose final conclusion uh, that will be delivered. 
But one thing that I find uh, important is, is the, the kind of aspect of complicity. And, and uh, I can only repeat what, what uh, Father uh, Dubois said so uh, kind of powerfully that genocide is a very, very public uh, crime. This is not something that is happening in secrecy. Uh, it's not even something that is happening far away uh, or in other places. And, and images like this um, uh, um, show uh, you know, Jews being paraded uh, through German uh, towns here, uh, Oldenburg, but there are many other pictures uh, showing other places. And of course, we cannot know, we cannot look into people's heads, right? Um, we cannot assume uh, to know what people are thinking. Uh, so these two women, for example, in the foreground, they are laughing. Are they aware of what's going on? Why are they laughing? Are they laughing at the Jews? What's happening in this moment? We don't know. But what we do know is they were there. Right, this is not secret. Um, and images like that, however, are much more telling, right? Because here we have a crime uh, in action. These are people who are looting from a uh, Jewish owned department store, um, uh, you know, also uh, um, during or in the day after Kristallnacht. So um, here is, of course, a very, very different images. Uh, these people are complicit because they're taking the opportunity to steal from this shop just, be, uh, shop just because they can, right? So if we cannot look into the heads of people in the first image, this is a very different image. This shows clear uh, complicity. If you're choosing to take these things, you are uh, becoming an, an accomplice. But I also want to draw your attention to uh, the kind of agreement with uh, the uh, Nazi expansionist plans and the war that was to fuel that. And I wanna draw your attention to the map on the right. And what is interesting, it's a normal street map for my grandfather. There's nothing uh, particular about this. Um, and uh, what is however amazing is that he chose to update the map. Um, so, uh, you may see that the, the Germany's boundaries are in blue here, but as Germany expanded, he updated the map accordingly. Austria, the Czech part of Czechoslovakia, neighbor. Right. So this is a man who agrees and in, as an officer was part of many of these expansionist plans uh, and what is so interesting is these different layers uh, in this map. So of course the boundaries um, of the 1930s, the boundaries of what Germany was um, uh, uh, before are also still there. Uh, please note that many of the place names that are uh, in Poland are still written in, in German, right? So there's a, there's a memory marker already there. This is our land, right? Then the actual borders at the time, and then my grandfather updating the map to show Germans expansion. So, and, and to me, this just mirrors the small Nazi is, is kind of uh, reconfiguring or, or living it for himself with the big Nazi here uh, is deciding. This is of course the map of the uh, secret appendix to the molotov ribbentrop Pact showing the new uh, German Soviet border at the expense of Poland. And I'm so struck between these two maps because they're really kind of showing what the big Nazi is planning, the small Nazi is willing to, to uh, then fulfill on his own map. And uh, it is also very clear that ordinary Germans and the many organizations they joined are complicit in, in these crimes, um, particularly of course the Wehrmacht that is far from a, from a you know, kind of clean, but is, is an army of accomplices, uh, an army that is, by the way, also uh, uh, entitled to, this, uh, to these crimes um, because of the infamous Barbarossa uh, decree by Adolf Hitler himself in which you know, all kinds of, of minor infractions could, be, uh, could lead to summary executions uh, by uh, German troops. And I'm particularly struck by this image that a colleague, uh, Petra Bob, found in an ordinary, normal kind of photo album of a uh, German soldier. And at first sight, this is probably 
there, there's nothing that uh, shows that a war crime is actually in progress. It is just a woman wading through shallow water. It's even, there's some kind of poetry in the rhythm of this image, how the uh, shadow of the tree and the shadow of the woman seem to be angled. Um, almost a serene scene, right? Um, there's no hint to a war going on until you flip uh, to the backside when it is revealed what this image shows. It's called Die Minenprobe, Probing for Mines. So they force this woman to walk through this water to see if there's any mines, right? So all of a sudden, the kind of serene image of just you know a summer day and a woman uh, wading through water that has no reference to the war gets this reference and the war crime that is in progress um, at the uh, in this image if you just flip it to the other side and that clearly shows right these soldiers who force her to do this and we have no idea what kind of unit um, that was other than the the name of the of the of the uh, of the soldier um, Right, we, we, we see that this is a war crime in progress when we just go to the other side. And it's very, very clear that the German army, and that is established by a host of other scholars, is very much an accomplice uh, to these crimes. And lastly, just to establish um, the, uh, the idea that, that, this is a, uh, um, uh, that this is important for German society at large, I wanted to show you this image and of course, uh, this is a, this is a, uh, yeah, here, come, come join us up front. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're here. Welcome, welcome. So um, just to show you this image, right, if we're talking about uh, complicity, of course, one argument that has often been made was that, all right, this is a male dominated society in which men make uh, decisions and that is absolutely true. However, this doesn't mean uh, that women are not in part also accomplices. And, and this image is of course, particularly telling right all of these men and this, this, this young woman uh, kind of given away in, in, in marriage. But if we look at um, kind of uh, expectations here then, then you know, women helped uh, Hitler uh, help to vote Hitler into office in similar kind of percentages as men did. There's very little difference in how men and women voted. Uh, you know, women often complied to Nazi ideals of, of uh, womanhood as wives and mothers, and in this sense kind of normalized Nazi expectations. Women benefited from uh, slave labor. Um, women, for example, in World War I were very, very quickly drafted into the labor force to make up for men serving on the front lines, much less so in World War II. Simple reason, uh, there was an abundance of slave labor available and as such, right, men and women uh, benefited from, from slave labor. And when, uh, you know, labor shortages compelled uh, um, the Nazis to to, uh, to uh, request female employees towards the end of the war as the war was going increasingly uh, uh, dire for Germany, uh, then uh, you know, women uh, answered that call too. So um, this is not to, to say that everybody is complicit in the same way, but clearly we can talk about complicity as a, as a, as a, as a burden on German society um, uh, writ large. Why am I so sure of that? What's, what are the sources? What's the evidence? Well, um, there's an abundance of evidence through um, letters that we have uh, from, from German soldiers, for example, that describe uh, crimes. There's an abundance of evidence from uh, um, post-war interviews where people really, uh, literally even in the 50s, say things like uh, Hitler was the, was the greatest uh, uh, German. We know that uh, full well from Gestapo reports where the Gestapo spies on, on ordinary Germans and finds very little disagreement, for example, with the uh, Kristallnacht um, uh, atrocities. We find that in diaries. We also find that in a very new source, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, wiretappings of German prisoners of war in American hands that were found in the National Archives. So here are German prisoners of war talking to each other. They have no idea that the Americans are listening in and are recording this. And what do they talk about? They talk about atrocities, which is incredible, right? I mean, two guys meet each other in America of all places. They are both uh, prisoners of war. 
Why do they talk about atrocities? How does the topic even come up? It can only come up if you can assume that your counterpart has the same experience. And indeed, the counterpart then often tops uh, whatever horror story is being told by a story of their own. So if this is complicity, I think, I think there's, there's, there's evidence to support this. Uh, compiled by, by historians uh, of, of much greater stature than, than me. This is not an argument for uh, German society, for everybody in German society, but for uh, German society writ large. So from complicity, how do we go from complicity to what uh, coming to terms with the past means? And here too, right, this is already problematic. Can we master the past? Can we overcome the past? Can we come to terms with the past? And once this is done, what does meeting that expectation even mean? Uh, for some, this would mean that we are entitled to forget, which probably is not a desirable outcome. But what I wanted to throw at the panel today is probably three aspects that we, can, that we perhaps can agree on um, that constitute what coming to terms with the past might mean. Justice, uh, compensation and restitution, as well as intergenerational memory. And that of course comes with a, with a timeline, right? Our, our moment of justice will pass soon. And yes, there are still um, uh, people being indicted for war crimes uh, today in Germany. There are people standing trial today in Germany. But of course, these are very, very old people and that window will pass very soon as, of course, the eyewitness generation uh, will pass. Compensation, uh, yes, but the story here will change too because it will be more about restitution of stolen property rather than uh, paying pensions, for example, or aiding uh, aging uh, Holocaust survivors. One thing that is not passing but clearly changing is intergenerational memory. Right. We have to talk to a new generation, the fourth generation uh, of Germans after, born after the war, and we have to tell the story differently. We cannot assume that it has the same meaning. We cannot assume automatically that uh, it will, the sides, the stage, the story uh, will have the same meaning for the next generation. Also because this generation is much more diverse than say my generation with lots of memory uh, coming in from other, um, um, uh, from, uh, from other events. And then let me uh, also point to, and, and Edward O'Donnell might appreciate that because Stuart Eisenstadt is, the, um, uh, it was, is a longtime friend and, and, and mentor of Edward's uh, you know, imperfect justice. We can only really render imperfect justice. Uh, and uh, here it's very, very clear, most perpetrators evaded justice. Uh, right? we, we cannot assume, uh, despite later efforts, that, that perpetrators writ large were, were prosecuted. Uh, sometimes German courts even overturned the Nuremberg uh, uh, courts and reinstated, rehabilitated perpetrators, right? We did this, this is true. Also in terms of compensation, German efforts are, are large, right? Um, you know, between 45 and, and uh, uh, 2018, the German government paid approximately 86 uh, or almost 87 billion uh, um, uh, dollars in compensation. This is a very, very large number. This is no doubt the, there's a sincere effort, but this, this effort wasn't always sincere. Most uh, victims, particularly if they lived behind the Iron Curtain, were only eligible in the 90s and many had passed since. And then with respect to intergenerational memory, right, we have very, very well-funded memorial sites, museums as part of the curriculum, right? This is not for lack of trying. Um, but at the same time, it's very clear as the, as the claims conference uh, report that, that some already cited uh, at this conference shows that Holocaust knowledge is declining in the US, but also in, in, in Germany. And as such, uh, Susan Neyman wrote this very, very friendly book, uh, Learning from the Germans, Race and, and Memory uh, of Evil. And she's uh, making the argument that, that somehow the German case can be a role model for how the United States addresses its own past. Um, please don't, um, right? The German story is a, is a German story in the German context with its trials and tribulations. And is, it is clearly a story of trying to, struggling to come to the past in a very sincere way. But the American story has its own 
uh, uh, components. And uh, these lessons are not, in my view, necessarily transferable. And what do we do now? Um, so uh, one thing that I find very problematic is a kind of redemptive memory that somehow you can tell the story of post-war Germany as a story from ruins to reunification and a story of overcoming the past, both of the Nazi past as well as the uh, uh, East German uh, dictatorship. And I worked a long time for the Haus der Geschichte, the House of History. It's a, it's a very large museum in Bonn. It's a beautiful museum. It's a wonderful place. But it's literally that kind of story. You, you enter at the, at the, you know, um, on the ground floor and then you go up and then Germany is unified and, you know, you, you arrive at a better Germany. And yes, this Germany is much better than most of its predecessors. But it is also a story of, oh, this is a nation redeemed uh, of its past. But it's not only that there, there's a sense that somehow the nation is redeemed, but we also have to grapple with a whole lot of stories that uh, we, we, we have to incorporate in our kind of uh, national mass narrative. And Buchenwald is a, is a place that epitomizes that because of course, this is the Nazi um, our concentration camp, but at this Nazi concentration camp, you know, after the war, the Soviets used it as a camp to intern uh, uh, former Nazis, but also those they deemed politically unreliable and many of them died. So what are we gonna do with this story of two dictatorships using the same place um, to, uh, 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 to uh, terrorize others? Germany's colonial genocide. We're only starting to acknowledge this story uh, and we're finding that there's lots of place names, lots of, of, of memorials uh, kind of still in place. This, this story has not been uh, um, uh, uh, really um, uh, clearly um, commemorated. And Germany is very, very reluctant, for example, in terms of, of compensation. And there's a lot of roadblocks to, to address this story. So what is it that I wanted to say, right, to set us up for this, for this panel? Um, I think I wanted to show complicity. I, uh, I think that's the starting point of any discussion about how Germany addresses the past it is to address the complicity of ordinary Germans. Knowing that there are many exceptions, but writ large, I think it's fair to say that. I think that this complicity then translates into an obligation towards justice compensation and international intergenerational memory as uh, the, the basis for coming to terms with the past. But I've also wanted to show that, yes, Germany has made tremendous efforts, uh, yet they are also only leading to imperfect justice, right? This past cannot be made good. And the German word even Wiedergutmachung, making something good in itself is highly problematic. There is no way to make good, no matter what you do. But it's also that we're really struggling to find ways to integrate other difficult parts of our history, be that our colonial past, be that the story of two dictatorships on German soil in, in post-war uh, um, uh, Germany. So with these thoughts, let me uh, also provoke you a little bit uh, and uh, talking about removal of, of, uh, of uh, memorials, sometimes it might be helpful to reinstate a memorial. And so uh, I couldn't help but juxtapose these two images. So this is of course, Robert E. Lee leaving uh, the statue in uh, New Orleans, but clearly everybody knows the statue was there, the pedestal is there, and yes, everybody still calls the place Lee's Circle, so you can remove the statue, but you cannot remove memory. Um, but what is interesting, there's also an initiative in Germany to bring back but distort uh, colonial uh, statues. So this is a, um, a statue to uh, uh, Governor Wismann, who was uh, Hermann von Wismann, who was uh, governor of uh, the colony, German colony of East Africa. Uh, where Germans committed horrible atrocities. And this project Africa brought back the statue, but they also distorted it. So the statue is him, of course, and uh, you know, he's looking down on Ascari, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, African soldiers in German, so uh, in German service, and he's kind of looking down on them. There's also a lion to his feet to show that Germans dominate people and nature. But you can distort that, right? You can put the lion on top and you know, can put the Ascari on top, but you can bring back memory through these, uh, these memorials and you can problematize memory by doing that. 
So I've, I've talked for a long time and you surely want to hear from our others, uh, very distinguished uh, panelists. So uh, maybe I can ask uh, um, uh, you both to join us here on stage. Herr Schneider, darf, darf ich Sie bitten, vielleicht dann, ähm, ähm, wollen Sie, äh, äh, Ach, richtig, was sagen? bitte, ja, gerne. <laughs> yes, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure. I'm running a little bit late due to the modern way of traveling and modern services. You know, airlines just cancel flights just by that and not just five minutes before they're supposed to leave. We have the same phenomenon also in Germany. Some people would wanted to visit me in Los Angeles. They got stuck because Lufthansa canceled some flights from Berlin to Munich or Frankfurt in order to bring the people here to the United States. But if this is not subject tonight, it's a much more serious subject. And thank you very much, Professor, for your uh, initiative. And thank you very much, Caroline Guy, the Honorary Consul of Germany, my dear colleague here in Phoenix, Arizona. And thank you to all of you. And thank you for inviting me into Genocide Awareness Week. As you know, that also Ambassador um, Küchler from Germany See, she will join you tomorrow, right? Am I, am I correct? But from Germany, as I see also here, here, um, who is there? I just cannot see that. Um, Edward O'Donnell, he's in Norway. Oh, <laughs> uh, hello. Do, can you see me? Good evening. Nice, nice to have you. Thank you so much. And I was asked also to make to be a part of the panel you organized. Uh, so uh, I'm ready to answer questions because this is uh, the Genocide Awareness Week comes in a time where it's genocide is very much an issue, not just from the past, but also from, 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 from now. We see Ukraine, I do have, we do have the colors here. I always say I take them off just the very moment when they have peace. So I will wear them all the time. But of course we should be careful always in comparing genocides or defining genocides. But when it comes to the Shoah, we all do know that it was really a genocide. That was the abyss of humankind's history and especially of Germany which this country where the, where the genocide was invented, the genocide in Shoah. So I just would stop right here. I would suggest and give, uh, give the floor back to you. I think somewhere, somehow somebody is moderating yeah. that evening. <laughs> here you go. So I'm just looking forward and thank you very much. Also the university. And I, I said just my last words to Karin too, when I visited you for the first time, I said, well, I, I, I will be retiring next year. And I, I will study again. And then they said, why do you, don't you study here? They <laughs> even have apartments for senior citizens. So well, <laughs> so that I will see, but we, we should stick to the subject, which is very serious, very important. And we thank you so much to being here because it's great weather and you take your time to be with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, so I think I start first with a question for Edward O'Donnell. Thank you for being there online. Um, you have a long history and I was wondering which restitution efforts you were directly involved in in Germany and Austria. Thank you very much and it's a pleasure to be with you. I wish I were there in person, but uh, Council General Schneider, I was a U.S. diplomat in Germany at, at, in my foreign service career, and I actually started at, during the Cold War as a second lieutenant in Germany in 1969 in Frankfurt, not that long after the end of World War II, and the Frankfurt Opera was still in ruins from the bombings during World War II, so I've had a fairly long history of, in Germany, both as a, a soldier in the Cold War and then later as a diplomat. And so I, I was later in my career in, involved as the executive assistant to Stuart Eisenstadt when he was negotiating agreements on behalf of Holocaust survivors and families of the victims. And that was in the Clinton administration. But if I could broaden this just a little bit to discuss my personal experience in terms of what Dr. Folker Binkert has set forward in terms of dealing with the, the Nazi past and my, my experiences, as a young diplomat, uh, one of my first assignments was the German desk at the State Department. And so I was the, actually the East German desk officer, which meant I had to deal with the East German embassy. And this was 1980, 81. And I had to read Neues Deutschland every day and what Erika Heinrich.